I recently attended Rapid TCT in LA, which is North America's largest additive manufacturing show. While I was there, I got to see all of the latest trends in 3D printing technology, materials, and applications. I thought it'd be cool to share with you some of the things I saw while I was there, including some very interesting print farm specific technology. So the first time I went to the show was in 2017 in Pittsburgh when I was just getting interested in the world of 3D printing. A couple of years later, I was manning a booth there, but it probably has been four or five years since I've been back, and I wanted to see what was new. Not surprisingly, there was a lot. I also managed to run into some other 3D printing YouTubers you may recognize in the wild, which was cool. But I was on a mission. No time for distractions. Are those 3D printed golf clubs? Now, some of you may know that Bryson DeChambeau, a professional golfer who won the 2024 US Open, uses a set of ultra custom 3D printed metal irons. Very cool, but definitely out of reach for everyone else. That's where Cobra comes in. They were the first to offer this cool tech to the masses. They released a limited number of 3D printed iron sets that were available to purchase to the general public. They also had a full on golf simulator set up at the show so you could try them out, including a closest to the pin competition for a 3D printed putter. Oh, that's a good shot, T. Ooh. I think that's inside our fifth. Oh, 11-7. I didn't win. Now, I know not everyone out there is a golfer, but I found it fascinating that a major brand like Cobra was willing to do this. And it's not just a gimmick either. The combination of 3D printing and optimization software from N-Topology means they can craft an iron that looks like a forge blade, but is forgiving due to the optimization of mass distribution, which is a fancy way of saying that you can miss the center of the club face and still hit a decent shot. Just check out the internal structure. I think it's a great application of additive and it makes me wonder what else it could be applied to. And number two is just that, metal additive. Now I know metal 3D printing systems are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Why would you care about that? Well, if history is any indicator, there will be a time when metal additive is within reach to us as hobbyists. When FDM and SLA machines first came out in the 1980s, do you think people had them in their house? Now look at us. For now though, traditional metal 3D printing is quite expensive. So it's best suited for industries like biomedical, aerospace, oil and gas, and defense. The most common processes use lasers to selectively center or melt very fine metal powder layer by layer to build parts. What's crazy is the speed, scale, and accuracy available today. Some of these parts are absolutely massive and highly complex. A relative newcomer to the metal additive world, which actually leverages 70 year old technology, is metal binder jetting. This process also uses a metal powder, but doesn't need to be as fine and uniform as the laser systems, which means the raw material is much cheaper. The metal powder is spread into thin layer and a sort of inkjet print head passes over depositing tiny particles of a binding agent. Temporarily holding the metal particles together, layer by layer, the part is created, and what you're left with is basically a metal powder candle, or a green part. This part is sent through a sintering furnace where the binder is burned out, and the metal particles are fused together. Now, if you know manufacturing, that last step sounds a lot like metal injection molding, and that's because it is. But instead of pushing a metal and binder slurry mix into a mold, it's printed. This is significant because the part cost and print speed allow metal binder jetting to start to compete with some mass manufacturing methods. It's basically the holy grail of additive to compete with legacy processes like casting, injection molding, and metal injection molding. And on the other end of the spectrum are the massive metal additive applications like ship propellers, valves, and even entire rockets. So all that to say, one, Super cool. And two, maybe one day we'll have a small metal binder jet to play with. You never know. For number three, let's bring it back to something relevant to all of us, and that is print farm technology. More specifically, the print farm in a box concept that a few companies are trying. The most notable is the mosaic array. What at first glance may look like a vending machine is actually, well, kind of like a vending machine. This is basically a mini print farm in a box with four printers, each with up to eight filament spools at the ready. Auto build plate unloading and print job queuing software platform to help keep it running around the clock. This is truly a lights out manufacturing solution similar to the pallet system on a horizontal CNC mill. What I really like about this setup is that it's modular, so each printer can be removed and replaced if needed. The print sheets are also loaded into a cart that can be swapped out so you never really have to interrupt production. But is this truly a print farm? I don't actually think so for one big reason, and that is price. This setup without the upgraded high temperature print heads will set you back about a hundred grand. And to me, this high price tag makes profitability and ultimately an ROI pretty tough to swallow in a print farm business. Don't get me wrong, there are business types that could probably justify it. But for most of us, a dozen or so high quality consumer printers will cost you a tenth of the price and will give you more output 
just not around the clock. What I think this will excel at is in a setting with multiple users and part needs. Think of schools, maker spaces, and corporate settings where the 3D printers are shared assets. One of the biggest headaches with that environment is managing and coordinating the print jobs. With the array, you could just queue up your part and let the machine do its thing. You don't even really need a human to manage it like traditional mini shared print farms would. Another similar product I ran into at the show is the Triadative Amcel, and it's a similar concept with a multi-printer ecosystem managed by a central control software platform. You can see that there's printers situated on both sides of a conveyor belt down the center that brings the finished build plates and parts to a hopper where they can be unloaded. They come in either one, four, or eight printer configurations and can even be linked together. The biggest thing I was scratching my head at though is that they elected to go with a Delta style printer, though to be fair, speed was probably a major focus during development. This company was created in 2016 in Spain and offers an interesting option to mass additive manufacturing. What do you think of these systems? Maybe they aren't an obvious choice for a homegrown 3D print farm business, but I say keep an eye on them because technology that makes the task easier tends to move the needle for the industry. Industry. And you know what makes creating an online business easy? Shopify. This is your all-in-one e-commerce solution that can make anyone a business owner in just a matter of hours. I use Shopify to build my online store and I could not be happier. Here's the thing though, you can use Shopify to build a simple store to get started, but you can also use the exact same platform to run a multi-million dollar global empire. It's crazy. And maybe you don't have a business now, maybe you think it's too hard to do or that you don't have the skills to build an online store. With Shopify's plug and play templates, including free templates, you heard that right, you can build an online business with your own branding in just a matter of hours. That means by dinner time tonight, you could be getting your first sale. Can you hear that? Don't settle for crowded online marketplaces or websites with an e-commerce plugin. Start with Shopify and build an online business, not just a website. It will truly scale with you as you grow. If you want to get started today, scan the QR code or head to shopify.com slash printfarmacademy. It's time to get off the couch and take action. Just try it. All right, number four is software. I've said for a long time that as the 3D printing hardware gets better and better, that will come a point where everyone can basically make the same box. The differentiator will be software. There are lots of companies out there doing this now, like Mark Forged. Yes, I used to work for Mark Forged, so I kind of have a soft spot for them, but something they're doubling down on is the use of AI and FEA, or finite element analysis. Their whole shtick is that they make strong functional parts. But the next question from an engineer is usually, okay, but like, how strong? The Mark Forge simulation software lets you upload a part establish the strength requirements, and then validate through FEA. But it takes it a step further by optimizing your part slicing and continuous fiber placement so that you can get the part you need without wasting time and materials. This is absolutely huge for functional 3D printing. Imagine what something like this can do to optimize slicing for non-functional parts too. Another software solution aimed at design optimization is N-Topology, which we touched on towards the beginning of the video. Taking the guesswork out of the designer's hands means parts are made more efficient, which ultimately leads to lower cost which, if we're honest, is one of the biggest barriers to overcome with 3D printing. It seems like each manufacturer is trying to develop their own unique solution in the race for software dominance to squeeze performance out of their box. But something to watch out for, in my opinion, are the third-party offerings too, such as the print farm software management options out there like 3D Printer OS and 3DQ just to name a few. And finally, number five is simply speed. As I'm walking around the show, it felt like everyone is now more focused on speed than anything else, other than maybe size. I personally think that Bamboo Lab had a big impact on this shift due to the meteoric rise to one of the consumer 3D printing powerhouses. As we know, Bamboo Lab machines are not only fast, but extremely reliable, which has historically been hard to combine. In fact, speed by itself isn't actually very hard. We've known how to move machines with stepper motors or linear motors extremely fast for decades. It's the software, computing power, and low-cost sensor options that unlocked it for 3D printing. And this goes right back to the last point about software being the differentiator, not necessarily the box itself. Bamboo Lab ran a masterclass on software development and sensor inputs to allow their machines to print so quickly while not losing accuracy or reliability. Now everyone else is chasing them, trying to unlock the same in their box. Or in other cases, some competitors just trying to make a very similar looking box. Like most things over time, the competitors will get better and the overall cost of fast, accurate machines will drop, which only helps all of us as consumers and 3D print farmers. When 3D printing was first developed in the 1980s and used almost exclusively for prototyping, speed wasn't a huge factor. Even with the printers running slow, they were still orders of magnitude faster than the traditional method at the time. Now, speed has become more important as the scope of 3D printing expands to compete with those methods. I also think speed is critical for adoption because in today's society, we're all about instant gratification. That part's gonna take how many hours? Do you know how many TikTok videos
videos that is? I'm curious to know what you think. What do you feel like the industry is missing and could do better with? Thanks so much for watching and happy printing.